Hello, everybody. This is Ian. And if you've been dialed in a bit early, you will have heard Candid and I banter for a while. But we're really, really both so happy to be here uh, with the I for PL and all of you to talk about how to prepare L&D professionals for the age of self-service learning. Uh, I myself have been a learning and development uh, professional and, and have run learning departments for the past 20 or so years. And what made us all successful in the past, what, what, what got us to where we are today, is not what's going to keep us successful. It is not going to keep our careers thriving and growing going forward. So today we hope to give you, and also later on in the session, learn from you. We hope to give you tips and guidance on what we think the keys are to making sure our professions, our functions, and our own professional development grows and thrives as time goes on. Now, if you've been here for even just a couple of minutes, you've heard a lot about Canda and I already, and we've had a wonderful introduction uh, from the i for pl Just a couple of things I'd like to add to that is I'm not only, uh, I'm part of Hemsley Fraser. Hemsley Fraser is a global learning and development uh, consultancy with offices in Canada, the US, Germany, the United Kingdom, France, and China. So we're able to help companies of all sizes all over the world. And not only am I a Hemsley Fraser employee, at one time I was also a client. Just a few years ago, when I was running a learning and development function for a global exhibitions company, I needed to hire a world-class learning and development company to develop a, a 20 different topic program of frontline management training courses. And out of 25 different organizations that we looked at, wound up with Hemsley Fraser. So, so everything that I'm talking about and, and that Candida is talking about, Candida even worked on my project. Yes. We're talking from, from both sides of the coin. We have been uh, in your shoes. We have been part of and have run learning and development functions. And, and, and now we're also from the uh, provider side as well. So thank you. Let me turn it over to Candida to say hello as well. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, again, my name is Candida Fridman, and I'm an associate with Hemsey Fraser. I've worked with Hemsey Fraser for over 15, 15 years in over 40 countries around the globe. Um, as Ian said, it's a very, it's an extensive array of, of, of countries and subject matter that we deal with here. I was originally based in the UK with Hemsley Fraser and now I'm based in Toronto. And um, as, as Ian said, I've worked with him when he was working at, on as a client and I myself, it has the background where I was at one point, the global head of HR and training for a multinational organization. So I too have seen the differences in training and development through the years. Uh, my aim is to take a practical business approach in helping organizations looking at the future. And that's what we're here looking at now, what's happening in the future with training development. And uh, my aim is for, to help you think about your future. And I wanna point out that we have the chat uh, on the side of this, and I have the chat bar. So please, anytime you want, if you want to put something on that chat, and we'll make sure that we discuss what you would like to hear. So thank you. Thanks, Candida. That's enough about us. And, and I've been in the business long enough to know that uh, about the last thing everybody wants to hear is a corporate sales pitch. And that's not why we're here today. Instead, yeah. for the next hour, what we really want to focus is on ourselves as a group, learning and development professionals, how to make sure that our function, our careers grow and thrive. So here's what we're gonna cover over the next 60 minutes. We're gonna take a very quick look back at the learning and development role, how it's grown, um, what we've been known for, and, and how that actually might even be holding us back. Strangely, what made us so successful might be holding us back in the current environment. We'll then look at the, the rise and the impact of self-service learning, something I'm not sure I would have predicted about 10, 15 years ago, but in the past five years has made a massive difference. We'll move on to the resulting consequences and how, how our historical perceptions plus the rise of self-service learning is, is putting us at a pinch point. And there are two directions our careers can go, our functions can go. We can either stay where we are and just see the interest and the belief in our function dwindle, or we can pivot in a few very key ways where we think if we make those changes, the future for learning and development will be very bright indeed. And we'll give you some very practical guidance about what it will take, what we believe it will take for L&D professionals to provide in the future. 
and how we can not only maintain the relevance, but really prove not only our individual worth, but the worth of our function. At the very end of the session, we're gonna do two things. One, we would like to show you um, something that we have internally that we think has made a lot of difference toward making learning and development successful, not only for our customers, but for us internally as a business at Hemsley Fraser. And then it would be remiss of us not to talk about the current environment. Global pandemic of COVID-19 has literally changed everything overnight. So forget at the end of the session, we'll move past talking about what do we need to do in general, but we'll talk we'll take a look at what can we, learning and development, do right now in this bizarre instance in time, this very critical instance in time, what can we do to help our organizations thrive? And again, Canada mentioned, anytime you'd like to chat with either her or me, please use the chat feature. We will have a, a point toward the end of the session where we'll open up the mics for everyone, but we are looking forward to hearing you on chat. And again, one last time, if I do all of a sudden freeze or pause, it, it's a bandwidth problem here in New York, I'll be back in just 15 seconds. With that, let me turn it over to Candida. Great, thanks Ian. So let's start with the historical role of L&D. And when we say the historical role, I know when you're listening to this, there might be some people that are at different stages of this, but let's go way back. Let's think about the past. In the past, uh, the, the role of L&D really was about creating, uh, teaching, responding to requests, teaching the classes, creating the contact, the content, uh, the learning st strategy was sometimes designed within uh, within the HR team, but it was really primarily focused on the people agenda on um, on certain areas that, as Ian said, the world is changing and we, we have to start looking at different areas. Now, as I say, this is historical and things are changing, but they're changing even more rapidly and evolving more than we ever realized right now. And it's not sustainable in this changing world. The past role of L&D is not sustainable. We have moved forward, but we need to move forward even more. Um, from this and, and the changing future, it means we need to continue to think of new ways, new ideas and, and new creative ways to be more effective. Uh, the world's changing, we need to be part of that. And that's what we're gonna be doing in the next part of this uh, workshop. So Candida, let, let me ask you a question then. In a very lean and mean and uh, lean training department where, where budgets are a factor, are you saying that you alone or you and one other person can't write every single course, can't teach every single course? I know this is a shocker out there for those people, but no, it's not possible. We need to be thinking about alternatives. And absolutely, as you say, it's, it, it's smaller groups. And so we need to be thinking, how can we thrive and move in the future with using the other resources rather than ourselves. And I know everybody out there is brilliant. I'm sure of that. There are other people who are brilliant too. So let's compound this now. We are, we are being asked to do more than we ever have before with, with fewer resources. Beyond that, there's a new factor, which is self-service learning. I, I, myself, Canada, each of you, we can go to a computer, type anything we want into Google and learn how to do anything, whether it's use Microsoft Excel or get basic management training or figure out how to fix an appliance or a TV that's broken. If my company has been so generous to provide it to me, I can go on to LinkedIn Learning or Coursera and view any number of hundreds of thousands of different online learning videos. There are podcasts, there's text, downloads, PDFs, whatever. Somehow, in the past five years, all of that content knowledge, which used to be locked up in the minds of L&D and qualified facilitators, is now available to anyone for practically no money at all. Practically no money at all. Yes, there are costs, but if you think of how much is out there, it's very minimal per any given resource. And what that's created in many ways is good. I am always a big fan of open access to information. The fact that if my refrigerator breaks, I can find a new part for it and learn how to replace that online is brilliant. But for learning and development professionals, it's also really, really scary for a couple of reasons. One, how do I know what my learners are viewing? How do I know if what they're learning matches what I want them to know? If they're looking up good policy on how to handle a progressive discipline con uh, conversation at work, is it the way my company believes that should be done or is it some other person's idea? Is this learning credible? Is the trainer online qualified? 
it also becomes scary for us learning and developing professionals because now that everyone has gotten used to videos on demand, audio on demand, guidelines, PDF books on demand, the demand on us to create these materials has gone from here already crazy to absolutely insane. And third, and most importantly, if all the training anyone could ever want is available in any way, whenever they could possibly want it, then the question for senior manager is this, why am I going to pay to maintain or even grow a learning and development team? Isn't the free stuff out there good enough? It's a, it's a bit of a scary moment if you're working in L&D. Believe me, I understand. Candida? So, uh, so based on oh, that- this is, I'm sorry, this is, yeah. this is still me. This is yeah. me. You're going. <laughs> It's live. It's all live. It's all live, just like Saturday Night Live. So this is where we are now. If we add it all together, this is where we are now. And I don't want to make a blanket statement to say that all of us are in this exact space, but there is a potential for some of us on this call, and I have been in this position myself, that learning and development, instead of being seen as that fantastic value add, we're, we're seen as just these order takers. We're asked to just provide training. Senior managers will come into us and say, I need management training, I need technical training, I need comms training. And in our desire to keep our relevance and quite frankly, keep our roles, we respond happily to those requests without really understanding what is the true purpose of that intervention? What would success look like? So we become order takers. Um, because as Canada said, in the past, so much of our training agenda has been created by a bunch of smart people in a room focused on the people agenda, we can be seen as not being in alignment with the true business needs, especially think today how everyone's business needs have changed. So what happens is if we're not able to be seen as providing a quantifiable business impact, we can be seen as very much a nice to have instead of a need to have. So I'm not meaning to sound alarmist. I'm sure we're, we're all, again, as Canada said, very smart, but I do perceive a risk that th there's a, an inflection point for the learning and development role. And what we need to do now more than ever is pivot to more effectively demonstrate and deliver the value that our, our roles do promise to deliver. And as Ian said, quantifiable, that's such an important word, uh, showing the, being able to show the quantifiable impact so that, that we are adding. And again, showing, so we've got to look now and think, so how can L&D really thrive in the future? Uh, thrive, survive and thrive. So if you could sit back, relax and try to think, what would be a way for um, L&D to thrive? And what is the way that you're doing right now to make it thrive? Some of the things that we've looked at and we've done a lot of research on this is what do people want and they want the business partners, practical, effective uh, uh, partners to the business side of it, solving real, uh, really challenge, challenging the business itself, facing the business, advancing the business objectives, looking at the business results, um, having learning strategies that align to the vision and, and goals. And I know having worked in this business a long time, I know that's something that a lot of people hear about aligning to the visions and goals of the organization, but people have to see it. They have to see it in a quantifiable way. And as I say, it's speaking the language of the business itself and the results. So you want to be seen as a learning content strategist. Learning content strategist is a great phrase to look at, to think about involving people involved in the strategy, involving in the content and really creating and delivering content that's appropriate and that can be sourced from outside, inside the organization in the most advantageous way to ensure success. But it really is about advancing the business objectives of the organization. So what can we do about that? Yeah, and, and, and just a quick pause point before we move forward. It would, it's very easy for us to tell you these things. You've got to become a savvy business partner even more than we are now. You've got to make sure that your learning strategies are aligned and we've got to become learning strategists. These are very easy bullets to write down. What I'm hoping to do now and Candid is hoping to do now is show you three, uh, three key techniques to actually go ahead and make that change happen. So we wanna go beyond just giving you lovely talking points. We wanna we want talk through our experience. We also wanna gain insights from you. So I'm hoping over the next few minutes, 
as we talk about each of these three areas, which Canada will introduce, we're going to hear not only from us, but through the chat, we'll hear from you as well. So Canada, why don't you kick it off and, and let's talk about these three future proofing things, because these three things that we're talking about really will make the difference and keep learning and development relevant. Absolutely. And again, as Ian said, please add anything on the chat as we're going through this, because again, we know that you're all professionals. We know that you all are dealing with this as well. And we're looking at, at that phrase of future proofing, making it possible to survive and thrive in the world that's changing that we're looking at right now. And there are three key, we're going to look at three key elements that's, that, that hopefully will help you in making this happen. And the first one is about engaging. And the idea is to engage, engaging the senior managers. As it says there on gaining the support of senior managers, but actively engaging. Engaging is one of those words that you can say to people to engage, but we're talking about actively engaging them to gain their support and their backing and getting them involved. And we will go over this, each of these elements in more detail. I'm just giving you a breakdown of the three to begin with. So the first one is about engaging. And the second one is excite exciting learners that word excite exciting learners getting them interested and captivated again focusing bringing intrigue into your content but really uh, captivating as ian said earlier we're competing against so many things that are out there now so we have to think of ways that are really going to excite with the content to the learners and first you engage you want to get the support then you're going to get people excited about the learning and the third thing that's absolutely crucial after that is to embed that learning, to ensure that learning is really lodged in people's minds. I don't know about you, but it, it's kind of what Ian talked about with all of these videos and things out there. I can watch something and then uh, it's gone in a minute. I mean, I, I, during this time where we're, we're learning a lot of things at home, I've learned how to cook things I never really thought I could. But I've cooked it once and I can't remember it after that. So it, we're looking now at I have to keep going back. We want to embed that learning, lodge it in their minds by leveraging technology, by using technology to le leverage it. It's, it's really about being able to see the value for money in training and building on where businesses want to go. So we will explore these in a little more detail now. So our first one, engage. Yeah, so, so you know, I'll, I'll, I'll let you take the lead on this one a little bit. As I mentioned, uh, the importance of actively engaging senior managers. So what can we do to get them to care? What can we do to be partners with the senior executives? What are some of your thoughts? That's a great question. And I, I, I just want to tell a story. Um, many years ago, many, many years ago, when I was head of a small learning function, I was taken out to lunch by my then manager at the time, the head of all HR. And I thought she was going to promote me. And it turns out she was there to basically say, Ian, do you know what? You're not really doing your job. And I said, what on earth are you talking about? And she said to me over lunch, your stakeholders, the heads of each of the, the functions, the business functions of this company, they tell me that you haven't met with their teams even once. And I thought to myself, well, of course I haven't. I'm too busy doing the work. And, and she helped me come to the realization early in my career that, well, the work is not just all the work. The work is also demonstrating your interest and in being there. And, and so I think to answer your question to start with, Candida, the first thing, if, if, if you want to gain the buy-in, if you want to engage senior management, if you want to engage the business, is ask yourself, honestly, am I doing everything I can to know that business? Do I sit on the weekly management or monthly management team meetings? Have I gained a space? Do I spend time actually in those functions so that they know that I care? Because how can I possibly get senior stakeholders caring about learning and development if I haven't first demonstrated that I care about the business? I think that's step one. What would you add to that? And let's, let's, let's ping pong back and forth. Absolutely. Since those two of us have several ideas. We're talking about having that empathy with people and understanding and interesting there. Uh, we have a, a chat, a, a comment from the chat, which says engaging is good, but confirming a partnership with senior management is even better. And absolutely. We're talking about that of ways to partner with senior executives. And I love the fact that you brought that in because that was all part of this about engaging senior management. We need to partner with them. And one of the ways I, I, I talk about that is uh, there's a phrase I like to use, which is talking to somebody else's listening. And when you're partnering with somebody in that senior management, 
We want to use the language that works with them. And I know, I'm sure there's a lot of people who will nod at this, that we all have our own little phrases. And especially in L&D departments, I've worked in many different organizations and everybody has their catch phrases or phrases here and there. And we need to be, if we want to really partner with senior management, we want to use their language, talking into the language that's going to grab their attention. You know, that's another, uh, another excellent point. Um, again, in the past, hopefully I, I've, I've learned over time, it is so easy to go into a meeting with senior stakeholders and talk about, well, I want to run seven cohorts and this is the value of blended learning and virtual learning. Those aren't the words that senior managers care about. They care about their business objectives. They care about how the learning will change the behavior that increases profit margin, increases revenue. So when we talk about learning and development to our senior stakeholders, are we using, are we using the terms that would show up in, in, in a learning and development magazine? Or are we trying to give them examples that tell stories, not about the learning, but that tell stories about how the learning positively impacts their business? Yeah. Um, in some cases, I guess another way to put it is, we, we really do have to do a lot more than we think we do on getting senior stakeholders to, to understand why they should care about learning, which may in the past have seemed fluffy or, or soft skills. It, it, it's not, it, it's all about the business. Yep. if we can use the right words in the right language. That's great. And somebody uh, has added that uh, we need to show how we add value to their business, help their business succeed. That's what we're talking about. It's adding the value added here. But there's a question that's been brought here is, uh, is how do we do this when we don't have clear direction from our senior management? So if you're not getting that clear direction, what can you do to, uh, to if there's no clear direction from senior management and and how can we also have a broader industry, as a broader industry, engage business and drive up interest? So we're looking at driving up the interest and, and if we're not getting clear direction. Well, okay, I'll start with that second one first. And, and uh, I, I know this is being recorded, but please don't tell anyone. But I, I always feel that silence means I get to go ahead. So, so in times in my career in the past, when I haven't been given a very clear direction, I, I take it as a wonderful opportunity to actually set the direction myself. And how much better does it feel as a learning and development professional when you can play in that space and start to recommend rather than just respond? Candida, how do you, how do you respond to that? Yeah, I think that's, it's, I think it's a great thing because I think sometimes when there isn't a clear direction, there's a reason for that, is they are, without saying it, looking to you as well to give your input. And so it's about that active engagement, actively <laughs> engaging uh, the, uh, people and, and getting, and, and if you have a great idea, we're in a world now where everybody has the opportunity to get that out there. So there are so many forms of communication that, that we can do to get our ideas out there. Yeah, I, another thing, going back to the other, and, and I might have misinterpreted the question, but something I find very, very challenging, and I've always found this challenging, is it, it is very hard, as, as you had said earlier, to make a quantifiable, or maybe I said it, quantifiable, measurable impact. The fact that I've sent... 500 people through a, a, a management training program doesn't usually uh, translate in a direct line to, I've made the company $280,000. Um, in addition to looking for ROI, I think, I think a, a, a really fantastic way to connect with senior management is, is think in terms of uh, qualitative statements. So we all, as humans, we respond to stories, not numbers it may not be possible to draw a hard monetary line between the training that you've done and business impacts. It is usually possible, most often it's possible, to tell real stories about behavioral changes that in the executive's mind, they can translate that. Uh, absolutely, I um, once launched a half million dollar sales training program. There, because our systems were in flux, we had absolutely no way quant quantifiably to talk about that but we were able to pass many stories back to the heads of sales and the CEO about how business was won because salespeople who had formerly not done X were now doing Y and now there's new business. We were many stories about our situations that once um, really stumped our employees, they were able to convert that into a closed sale. So think not only about the numbers, think about the, the good news stories you can tell. Great, and there are some great um, points that have come up on the chat and they will be covered. Some of them are really about um, pre ensuring that we have 
a learning culture, how can we, and we will be talking about that in the next slide when we talk about Excite. But I also want to point out that somebody has said about the importance of not uh, uh, just honing in on a few key areas. I think that's a really important point that, that has been mentioned. It's also important to hone in on a few, fo uh, few focus areas with the business. It can get lost if you kind of try to do too much. So we're looking at doing the right things to, um, to we've, we, we're, we've talked now about engage and we will move on with the questions that you have. I think it'll be answered when we um, look at the Excite, which is coming up. But uh, I think we have a poll first here. Yeah, so we're going to ask our friends at I4PL to please put up this poll question, which is how successful do you feel you've been in engaging with your senior stakeholders? And I don't just mean meeting with them on a regular basis, but how successful do you feel you've been in really capturing their attention and more importantly, capturing their investment money into your function? So we'll give that, uh, we'll give that a good 30, 40 seconds. Again, we'll also be looking for uh, comments in the chat if you don't want to use the poll. We'll be happy to uh, take by chat, but how successful do you feel you've been in really engaging with your senior stakeholders? Yeah, is that something out there that uh, people feel it is happening from the, from the chat so far? I've kind of got a mixed idea. So any thoughts that you have, if you just want to answer the questions there, from very successful to not at all. And we'll ask I4PL when they're ready to just go ahead and show us the answers to that, uh, to that poll question. And the answers look like they're being collated now. And there we go. So yeah. Uh, not surprised. Yeah. I am not surprised that many people feel we're somewhat successful. I, I, I think we've all had, we wouldn't be where we are today if we all haven't had certain success. But I think many of us uh, would feel, pardon me, many of us would feel that we, we can always do better. And, and in this right. time where investment money is limited, that is oh, such a key, such a key factor. Yeah. Any, other, any other things to add here, Candida? There's something that came up on the chat that it said something I found works for engagement, whether you are an internal or external training function, is to get the senior leaders and especially operations folk to give you, your team, a tour of their work. This is best before there's an actual training project on the table. That's great. It's making people feel part of something. It kind of goes with what Ian said about visibility, getting people to see the operations. Okay, so... Well, let's move on to our next area then, which is uh, exciting the audience. So picture the picture the, the working life of any uh, office or plant worker or any, any person today that, that's employed in any capacity anywhere. Our lives are incredibly busy. We have 10, 12 meetings a day. We're either on our feet, rushing from place to place, or working to very, very tight timelines. And all of a sudden that precious 15, 20 or 30 minutes comes up and the person gets a chance to take a break or reflect or learn. And right in front of them is a computer with just a few clicks of a mouse, they can be looking at a YouTube video or watching a show on Netflix or reading their favorite book. How on earth can we get them to care about the content, not the entertainment content, but how on earth can we as this lean, mean learning and development team, get people excited about the learning that will drive the business objectives. And I'll throw that out to Canada. What, what are a couple of uh, ideas that you've seen work really well? And there are a lot of things out there. And we're also happy for you to share any ideas that you have. Absolutely. But absolutely. Thinking about ways how you can ensure you're effectively communicating your online training. How do you get them excited? A lot of people, a lot of the times it's in how are you communicating it? Are you making it fun, relatable to people, um, getting them excited about what they're doing? There was having all the time at home that is both good and bad these days that we're all dealing with. I was watching a, a program and, they, uh, and it was about how to get people excited and, and uh, really involved in something. And it, it told, uh, they said something that really hit me and that's the people remember stories, not stats. Yeah. But we, we are so, so much we put numbers down. We, we say these numbers, this shows it's successful. But think about in the past, the courses that you've been on, the involvement you had, and those people who tell stories that you can really relate to. So getting people excited by involving them in the stories of how your learning journey, how online le learning has helped you. Um, you know, you want to have face-to-face -face discussions and demonstrating to people, demonstrating. And that kind of goes back to that chat that, the, the, that somebody mentioned about bringing them around, being part of that. Uh, there's something on the chat that uh, has been mentioned, show the learners how they can add value to their organization 
by knowing this information and investing it in their own learning. Use examples. Well, yep. Yeah, sorry, I'll add in there. There's a phrase yeah. I love. It, it's it's the WIFM. What's in it for me? W I I F M. If it, you know, we have all seen it, and and I'm sure we've all done it. You know, there's a compliance training that has to be done, and we send out the most boring email ever with the where, the when, and the how to watch this, um, you know, th this class that just has to happen. That's not going to move hearts and minds. Canada also used a few other words. It's got to be fun. It's got to be friendly. I, with all this entertainment content available at the tip of a fingertip, you know, yeah. you know, in an instant, how can I grab attention? And I like to use, uh, you know, call me old school if you like, but I use every single tool at my advantage. Now, granted, we're all working from home right now, but if you've got digital signage in the office, use it. If you've got the ability to print up signs, use it. Emails, desk drops, uh, a lunch and learn where you give out snacks. I mean, if you think about to drive people to entertainment content, companies spend billions of dollars. Now, we may not have billions of dollars in our budget, but we've got to think about the promotional and marketing side. Just because we've built it does not mean they will come. We have to really promote the heck out of all the classes in order to drive the employees there. Uh, it, it, it's just something we don't think about. We think we offer it, so of course they should show up. It, we, we've got to get their hearts and minds as well. Absolutely, there's some great points that have been raised and I, uh, I'm gonna throw out a few things up here is, Training should be a solution to employees' performance, not considered as a compliance act. A solution so that people see that there are results, that it's not, I, I, I'm sure, again, there'll be a lot of people who nod their heads at this, that people, mm -hmm. people go to these courses and they, they do the learning just to tick a box, as, you, as somebody mentioned, a compliance act. But really, if they see this as a solution, exactly in, in Ian's word, what's in it for them, uh, that there's a benefit, that it's meaningful for them, um, so, and somebody has also mentioned, I train mostly self-employed people, so it's even more important that what's in it for me and, uh, um, and what people can do about that. It, so people, and keeping it short, I love this, is people really do have short attention spans. And what Ian said earlier about the fact that it, nowadays there are so many things that are competing for your attention that we wanna have short bite-sized little nuggets and bite-sized nuggets that people can take away and go, that actually was really useful. And for me, as I mentioned, that when I heard that phrase, people remember stories, not stats, that stuck with me. That's a short, quick phrase that will always remind me of something. So we need to be thinking about things that are really going to relate to them and get them interested and fun. So let's ask you again, and we'll ask our friends at I4PL. So we'd like to know, what are you doing to excite your employees about your learning content? So the poll will appear in a minute, but in addition to the very general choices we're giving you on the poll, we're just curious if, if there's anything that, that you do here that, that's not on this list, please put it in the chat and Canada will shout it out. But uh, personally, I, I use literally every single one of these things. I'd love to see what you use in addition to what's on this um, what's on this poll? What else do you use? Because I always love new ideas. I'm sure Canada does as well. Yeah, it's great. Throw them out there on the chat, what you have. And somebody has mentioned something that uh, uh, people are often excited when they believe, uh, when it relates to their purpose, the purpose. So again, with, with the emails, with the meetings, with the signage is, uh, what is the purpose? Why? Uh, you know, starting- what is it Simon with, Sinek, right? Isn't that Simon Sinek who, who start with why? Simon Sinek, yes. Who, starting with why. It's a great- uh, um, it, it's a great started video to look at, but that why people more than ever, let's face it, with what's going on out there, we're all asking why, aren't we? With absolutely everything. So we need to be thinking of how do we bring those people in? Remember, the more you get them excited, the more you'll feel excited too. The more, I, I love the job when I see people excited when I go into to, to classrooms, to workshops, and people are, they really want to be there and they see the benefit. So let's see the results of the poll popping up here in just a couple of seconds. So I am not surprised. Email is, is just, it's a tool that we all have. Uh, we all have at our disposal. It is the most used tool. I am never going to say that email is not a good tool. I will definitely say it should not be the only tool. Mm -hmm. So moment yeah. of truth here for everybody. If email is the only way that you're communicating out to your audience base, I would say this is a good opportunity to look at what your colleagues are doing. There are many, many, many different things 
uh, that people are doing. Yeah, and um, there's something that came up on the sign here about doing demonstrations, demos of how the technology can be used. And there are a lot of people out there who have that physical intelligence and, and by demonstrating it, they mm -hmm. will always remember it and it will really help them to, to take that learning and it'll excite them. People are afraid of things until they until it's demoed for them. So that's a great hands-on yeah. tool. And there are two other things which which I, I I'm really really pleased to say to see this. First of all, the use of video, especially if you've been in the business for I don't know 800 years like myself, um, trying you know trying and and really believing in the power of new modalities can be a challenge. Well, video is one. Uh, I would never have thought of just a couple of years ago filming a video with with an iPhone and thinking that's actually a valid communications tool for corporate training. Well, but it is, it is. And combine that with messages from senior leaders, business leaders are the most impactful people to your employees. If you can get a 30 second, one minute handheld video shot from the head of a department or your CEO, that will drive so much focus and attention to your program. So I'm really, I'm really pleased to see that we're all taking these chances that we, we might not have in the past. Yeah, that's great. There's a lot of stuff out there. So thank you for those. And our last of the three in Canada, why don't I let you start this one? Right. So again, I, I, um, as I mentioned about uh, future-proofing your role, we looked at engaging senior managers. We looked at exciting the learners. And now we have to look at that, that third crucial part, which is embedding, embedding it. We've talked about um, uh, the great aspects for that. But if you don't embed the learning, then they've seen it. Uh, it's over and on to the next. And as people have said, people's attention spans really are short. There's lots of distractions out there. So what can we do to embed that learning to um, to really uh, effectively bring that knowledge? What are your thoughts, Ian? I, I, I'm laughing as you read this, not, not because I'm laughing at what you're saying, but I'm reminded of a conference that uh, a, a partner of mine at Hemsley Fraser and I went to where it was in January. We were at a learning and development conference with about 50 uh, CLOs, chief learning officers for 50 of the world's top organizations. I can't share the names, but the top organizations in the world. And we asked them a very similar question. What do you, you know, what do you do with technology? And what stunned me, what blew my mind was that almost to a one, they all said that actually they have to go around their their learning technology the learning technology they had in place many of which were older style lms's or, or or not quite the newest generation it actually detracted from the learning experience and i think uh, when we were chatting the other day you were talking about what is it how every time you go into an organization and you reference their lms's yeah most people don't even know it exists yeah I, I, and I'd, I'd love to hear from people about that if they're if they're nodding out there but i go into these classrooms and and there are the people who have spent an absolute fortune on their LMS systems, and there's tons in there. But and when I ask the class, it, there's at least half, most of the time, who say, I didn't know that was there. Oh, how do I get to it? Um, it's too hard to understand. Nobody's really explained it to me. It's confusing. It's difficult to navigate. I hear this all the time. Does anybody else hear any of this? Well, let's, let's actually ask people that, that question right now, mm -hmm. because I think it's really critical. So... And, and your your experience may be very different than ours. Certainly, uh, certainly, yeah, together, much much more experience than we do. But so, do you have the learning technology that enables your learners to really? And I'm going to add to this question. It's not only find the content they need quickly and easily, but 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 does your technology really create that learning culture of it? it, it it's driving people. It's welcoming people, and it supports ongoing learning past the training room. So here you go. Here's your third poll question. Do you have the technology that, that, that really allows you to create, create that learning culture where people know where everything is, they're encouraged, it's easy to use. Go ahead and answer that in. And I see some things coming in chat. What are you, what are you seeing there, Candida? Yeah, I, I'm finding this really funny that somebody's written, doesn't LMS stand for laborious maintenance system? Yes, it does. Yes, yes. <laughs> Uh, so far, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of no's that their learning technology is not, is not helping very much, is not working for them. Um, and Andrea, are you seeing something in a Q&A bubble, which is just popping up, or is that just me that can see that? Oh, that's just you. Okay, that's I'm good. seeing a quite No, so, okay, someone else just answered, no, no, we do not have, have the right learning technology. So let's see the results there. 
Yeah. yeah so, okay. That's, uh, I am thrilled. 30% of you have technology that really supports your aims and will help keep your, 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 uh, your function really in lockstep with what the business needs. But if you add up the last two, uh, for over 71% or 70%, yeah, these numbers are adding up to 101, if I'm not mistaken here. All right. Fully 70% of people on this call don't have that experience. And so we've done a lot of thinking at Hemsley Fraser about what, what could actually change that. So we've given you already three different, um, three different ways forward. Number one, of course, is to more effectively engage with, with senior managers and, and your stakeholders. Number two then, doing everything in our power to really attract and, and drive people to the content that furthers those business objectives. Number three, we think the most important thing is to of course, give your employees the technology that, that, that really both creates that learning culture, keeps them um, in touch with the learning for a long time. We, we've discovered that what people want in a learning solution, a tech, a, the technological part of a learning solution, is what they have now when it comes to entertainment content. So all day long, especially now that I'm home, I'll be going to Netflix, to YouTube, to Spotify, to Hulu, to Amazon Video. I can find what I want whenever I want it easily. And I, at any single time, I can do that on my laptop here. I can use my iPhone, my iPad, any device. And I'm not forced to look through this ridiculously long catalog to find what I need. Actually, what I want actually gets floated up right to me. And the other thing is, especially with the newer TV set-top devices is, I don't have to go to this platform for this content or this platform for this content. I've got a single place, one single place where I can go to, to get all the learning content I want. Candida, does that sound like a good solution to you? It's, <laughs> that's a loaded que question there. It yeah. sure doesn't. I, I was just laughing, thinking, I bet there's people out there that right now have either Netflix, Hulu, Spotify, or something like that, all have tabs open. They're ready to go on it. And, and, and again, they're excited by what they're seeing out there. So yeah, this is what learners want. That's how I see that. So I can tell you that this is the only part of this webinar, and again, this is in no way, shape, or form a sales pitch, but what, what I wanna show you is Hemsley Fraser's own platform. And, and the reason that we wanna show this to you is because this technology does exist. 30% um, of you have something that really works well for you and is effective. Others, like me in my previous roles, I, I really didn't have a solution that was good. But I wanna show you how, how you can build a system for learning that works just as well as any of the systems we use for entertainment. And this is not just something we use for clients. This is something we use internally as well. So hopefully, and Candida, would you just confirm, please, you can see uh, our, our hub, our learning hub. And, and I'm really glad we're doing this because a lot of on the chat line, people are asking for ideas. A lot of the things people are saying is, what can we do? Where can, uh, you know, what are some ideas? Can you show us anything? So that's sure. exactly what we want to do now. We want to help. We want to do this so that you can thrive. So I'll pass and, it. And it only going to take about five minutes just to show you the, the similarities uh, and how engaging and easy this technological uh, learning, learning engagement platform is. So immediately, you log on here and there's a section called shared with you where your learning stakeholders, maybe the learning and development department or other colleagues can share with you content they either want you to see or think you might find interesting. So here's my colleague, uh, Lindsay, sharing with me a few ideas she thought I might find interesting. And we're using not just, uh, we're, we're not learning, you know, no person is an island, we all learn in a community. So I think it's really helpful, like on Netflix, you'll see here floated out very, very easily right to you what other people have been finding interesting, the trending content that people have been finding very, very helpful. Using machine learning will also give you an idea of based on what you've already viewed, based on how that is tagged in your, your previous browsing, what other content you, the user, might find valuable. And of course, like any system, uh, we'll show you what you've already recently viewed so you can find it, and we'll show you it's been recently added so that it's very, very easy for you to see what's new. Um, you can browse through content. You'll see here, this interface is just colorful and fun. And this content is not just learning and development content at Hemsley Fraser. We don't just use this to engage people with learning, but 
also creating our culture. You talked about, uh, someone talked about in the chat, how important it is to create a learning culture, especially in a time of crisis and quick change. How do you get those key communications out? How do you, how do you keep people up to date on what's really critical? What I'd like to do is just take a quick look at some of our learning content here. And we've only loaded a few different things. Internally at Hemsley Fraser, we've got over a hundred of these different playlists, but I'll go into the coaching playlist here really quickly. And again, this is not overwhelming. This does not look like any LMS you've ever seen before, but rather than throw you a thousand assets, we believe in the power of curating content. Remember, as Candida talked about, it's about being a learning content strategist. It's not about giving them 500 learning resources on coaching. It's about giving them five or 10 that match your needs. So we've got infographics. Uh, these are electronic uh, books called fluid books quizzes and, and videos, just a small curated selection. And these are all, you can see very, very bite-sized resources here. We make it easy when you see a piece of content you like to share that with another employee or a group of employees. You can like it. We all love to like things and you can save it to your personal profile page. Now, what I'd like to point out here is, and, and just to be incredibly clear one last time, this is not about Hemsley Fraser or our content. We're just showing you that it does exist. And I'm sure other solutions exist like this, where you can not only put our content on it, but you already, each of you already has, must have some amazing learning content on a variety of topics. You probably also have learning uh, vendors and partners that you have a long relationship with. You can add those resources right to this very easy to use sequentially numbered playlist. So if you have a coaching company that already offers great training videos or great training guides, why not add that? It, it's, it, you don't have to live in a world where it's either that vendor's content, you can absolutely um, mix and match content as well. Very so quickly. I, yes, I, go ahead, Candida. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that, that somebody has asked about um, how easy it is for learners to find the critical learning content on here. And I, I've got to say, I'm not a technology whiz by any means. And I find this to be, it's, it's so easy to click on things. And what's fantastic is there are things on here that if you have five minutes, if you have 10 minutes, if you have 30 minutes, if you have an hour, it takes you through things in a, as much amount of time as you want to. Right, yeah, several ways to find content. As, as a learning program administrator, you can basically pin it to this first page by sharing it with your team. Uh, if you want people to look for it, they can either browse. Here again, we see those topics, or here's an alphabetical list of all the uh, different options and playlists that are available. We have hundreds of playlists. We, we just have a short selection loaded onto this. And of course, we'll have a search. So if I want to see a coaching infographic, there it is, right, right, right there. It, it's very easy to use. Before we move on to our next section, I just want to just show uh, one more feature of the hub. And, and I keep going back to, it, especially in this time, it, it's not just about learning. It's also about keeping people connected. And one of the things that we use this for, which has been really great now that we've all gone virtual, it's called a shout out playlist. So we've, we've given people the ability just to upload different videos that, that they've shot at home on their iPhones. And here we've got just a, a really nice way of keeping people connected when they're, they're not able to be connected. So, so, so many different possibilities. What we're going to do is in our follow up to everyone uh, tomorrow to everyone who's attended, we're actually going to show you how you can for free actually uh, do a trial of the site and play with it for yourself. So in addition to the presentation someone asked about and some other information about us, uh, we'll also give you access to that hub. But what we'd like to do right now uh, is, is take the last few minutes and there's one more topic we'd like to talk about uh, in addition to these three topics and then we'd like to open it up for your comments and questions. So let's do that and let's Let's talk about really addressing where we are now. Yeah. Um, this is a, a challenging time uh, beyond the, and, and I, I truly feel in Canada, I'm sure we, we just feel, um, we feel such compassion and, and sympathy for everyone that has been personally affected by the pandemic and by COVID. We know that many, many people are struggling. Beyond that as well, there's also the, the vast, vast change in how, overnight change in how we've all done business. Companies that were 80, 90, 100% in person has now suddenly gone virtual. So 
everything we've talked about before now are some things that will help you in the future maintain and grow the relevance of your function. In these last few minutes, we want to talk to you just a little bit about what we've learned we can do as learning and development professionals, what we've learned you can do right now to help your company that needs you desperately find their way through this, through this very, very challenging landscape. And those three things are this, is really help build momentum around goals. Candida, let me let you talk about this one because I, it, it really is all about the why. Everyone is asking now more than ever before about the why, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And you want to have people involved building that momentum. We've talked about engaging and exciting people. You want to have, uh, you know, why, uh, why is this, uh, why are these goals here uh, about uh, bring the momentum around, uh, build the momentum around the goals, the values, the business results, the business objectives, being business partners uh, with people. So you want to keep it moving fast as so many of people have put in that chat line as well about the fact that things are moving at a rapid pace. So we need to be going along with that and, and, and moving fast and, and working towards what people need as the world is changing. I, I'd add to what you've just said there, the, the best way we can provide added value in this time is going up to our stakeholders and say, look, how, how can I help you? Can I help you not only with learning, but can I help you with messaging? A big part of what we do as learning development professionals is promotional, is preparing people for change, and is helping people get through change. Think of all the change our senior stakeholders are being asked to, to put into place right now. We have mad skills, my friends. It's not just about teaching. It's also about promoting and communicating. Yeah. That feeling of connection, the second one, everyone, myself, all of us on the phone included, We've gone from being in an office to where we feel connected with friends and colleagues to being alone most of the time. Well, how do you create a connection, not, not just with your peers, but with your entire teams, with the entire company? So training on building connections virtually, um, creating forums for people to come together, whether it's a Zoom happy hour, whether it's, um, whether it's just a fun email chain. We had several going in the first few weeks of this experience where every day there was a, we called that person in honor of the old TV show Love Boat, Julie the Cruise Director. And every day Julie the Cruise Director would have to come up with a fun question or a fun task to get their teammates involved. These are again things that learning and development professionals were really in a great position to lend not only our guidance but also lend support. So let's take training as not just being about learning but about helping be one of those golden threads that help tie people together. And I just wanted to add to that, that, um, you know, in, as Ian said, in the first few weeks, people do do this. They get that feeling, that connection. But remember, this is an ongoing situation. Yeah. It's, you need to keep that connection going. It's great to say, oh yeah, we're connected. Yeah, I can move on and do that. But this is about continuously keeping that, that feeling of connection. And especially mm -hmm. remote teams, anything like that, people need to be brought together. Well, and who better to do that? I mean, we're the people that during the best of times, we're the ones always bringing in people for live events. We're the ones always bringing people in for virtual events. We not only have the logistics experience, but we have the tools. So make sure that, that, that you're doing your part in sharing those tools with the rest of the company. Last thing is, is really, it's about getting information out rapidly. The situation in the world is changing. Our business priorities are changing every single day. We have to flex a little bit now as learning and development. I know I like to have weeks, maybe even months before I launch a class because I want everything to be perfect. The order of the day is not perfect. The order of the day is fast and furious. So uh, I, would never, I would never say lower, lower quality standards and rush out a product, but think about, as Candida said, these bite-sized learning things. It all doesn't have to be a, a five-hour class. A one pager will be great. Uh, an infographic can be fine. Do you have the ability to produce those bite sized learning nuggets in a place where everyone at the company can access it? And Candida, let me see if you have any other feedback on that. I just want to pass that somebody on the chat has said another important aspect is to be recognized as a trusted source for information. And trust is a crucial, uh, uh, is a very important word right now. It's building that trust with people. But yeah, the, the rapid sharing, the, the learning, the, um, the fact that we have attention, that people have the attention span of, of 
just such a short amount of time. There's so much out there. So if we don't get it to them fast, they're already thinking about the next thing. So, you, you know, even tasters, I think somebody had mentioned uh, up there, I think uh, earlier on in the chat, it had been people's attention last seven to 10 minutes, if that. I'm pretty impressed that it was seven to 10. But, you know, those video tasters, if you think about when you're watching movies, they always have that little preview before. We need to start doing that with, with sharing and learning, a preview that gets people excited. I want to see that. Yeah. As we start to wrap up, there are literally only three minutes left. And we all know that the most important thing a trainer can do is make sure everybody honors the agreement and gets you out on time. We'd never want to keep you late. So <laughs> in the chat, if you'd all be so kind, if you have any remaining questions or comments, um, while we're waiting for those messages to come in, I'd just like to say on behalf of all of Hemsley Fraser, especially in Canada, um, thank you for this opportunity. We, we certainly hope that by being here, we've given you some real concrete ways forward. We do promise to follow up with you with not only a copy of this deck, but also your access into that hub, just so you can see a, a more fun world. And of course, we're always happy to talk more and, and, and brainstorm ideas and see how we can help you. I see some more comments come in, Ken. Yeah, and, and Ian, there was a quick question somebody said about how does this type of system integrate with other platforms such as LinkedIn Learning? Are, are you... Uh, I, I, well, it, I, I can answer. I can answer it partly. We do connect to a number of different systems. I personally, I, I, I'd have to refer you to our technical team to see if LinkedIn Learning is one. I will say that there are some LMSs that we connect with through direct API. We're also able to deep link into nearly any system, and because we have SSO, and I'm sure LinkedIn Learning would also have SSO, we would be able to link out to uh, many systems. We will have to get back to you on that question about LinkedIn Learning, though. And another question is, are we sharing the recording? Yes, the, uh, I, I believe. Absolutely. I guess, yeah, you'll, you will get a copy of that. And as Ian had mentioned, also to understand more of the Hemsley Fraser Hub. Yes, and of course, I will not be listening to the recording, recording because I, I, I hate recordings on my voice. I'm sure everyone else does. Sure everybody what, gets that. <laughs> what other questions and comments do, do you have? And again, thank you for your time this afternoon. And, and somebody has asked about uh, customized course material and pricing, and you can ask those questions directly to Hemsley Fraser. You can look at their uh, website online. Um, again, uh, if you want more information, it's all there. Yeah, we'd be happy to give you that. Our, our Canadian representative, I believe, is also uh, on, on the line right now with us, our head of the Canadian office in Toronto, I believe it is. Yeah, in uh, Montreal, Isabel, yes. Oh, Montreal, I'm sorry. I'm focused on Toronto. You're in Toronto. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? All of that information, and uh, we really appreciate it. It's been great to see all the thank yous, and uh, it's nice to be around like-minded people. We really appreciate your time. Uh, I know that right now people are sitting at home looking for things, but I hope this has at least given you some thoughts over the last hour. Thank you so much for your time, and I, I4PL, thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, chat with such a great group of people. Have a great day, everybody. Yeah, have a great day. Take care. Bye.